Okay, um, I yeah, very much enjoyed that. Um, I, I don't want to take too much time because I'm really looking forward to the next keynote speaker. Um, so I'm going to read this a bit quicker. Uh, I don't want to eat into any of that. Um, but um, Kolareli uh, Shanaike, um, it seemed really important to have voices from outside the sector at this conference. Um, it also seemed important to have much, uh, as much influence from around our institution. Um, when I put out some feelers um, to see if anyone uh, could recommend some speakers for the day, uh, Anel, our uh, esteemed law lecturer, um, has uh, emailed me Colorelli's name um, and told me equivocally <laughs> that um, we should book him. Um, but this wasn't a difficult sell. Um, I've since become something of a stalker of uh, Colorelli's uh, The Great Speech podcast and all his online resources, which are a really excellent um, archive, um, and I recommend everyone. We're all orators as teachers, and it's just I've already learned an awful lot from, from, from following that. Um, um, one of the insights I've picked up from neuroscience to try and segue this a bit, um, or learning, is, is improved by the socio-emotional uh, socio context of the thing being learned. Uh, that it's not just enough to be given information um, and told to learn, um, as, as our, you know, Shazir was just telling us. Um, um, to improve this process, we need to feel there is a good reason. We need the context and the motivation. Um, in some ways, this is nothing new to educators. Um, I've often thought about it as the feeling in the room. It's really nice to have a feeling in the room again. Um, some rooms become charged by their educators, not necessarily through charisma, but often because of passion, but because ultimately they care. When we were communicating about this conference, I hope Colorado doesn't mind me saying that one of the only requests he made was to see what the room looked like. Um, to get a feel for the space, um, and it was a lovely thing to hear. Um, we're at a juncture, not only in education, but in the history of humankind, whereby our primary method of educating, voice, language, story, narrative, is in the process of becoming something different, perhaps more effective, a certain kind of change, but not necessarily the most important tool for some of the most important tasks. And for all the while that we humans spend time trying to communicate difficult ideas to one another, speech will continue to be our brush and our palette. So it is with great pleasure uh, that I welcome Colorelli to, to the lectern today uh, to help us become better at being ourselves. Wow, hello everyone. I have to say it's lovely being in person, isn't it? But one of the things I realize is, because this is my first in-person keynote speech for a while, and what I realized is I've spent the last year in slippers. <laughs> so shoes is actually feels like a very, very new thing. Um, but yeah, no, really great to, have to be here. I loved the previous keynote. Um, had so many questions, which I'll have to reach out and ask her. Um, but yeah, so the question on many people's minds right now, the question that I have been asked more than any other in recent weeks is, is it coming home? <laughs> All right. <laughs> I guess we'll find out the answer on Sunday, right? <laughs> but like many of us, in the minority in this country. My emotions when it comes to supporting England in football or in any other sport is complicated. But it shouldn't be, right? After all, I was born in England. I grew up in England. My children live in England. I met my wife in England. Although I am Nigerian, like my wife and children, I have a British passport. My children have British passports. When I complete any form and tick the box about who I am, I tick British. 
And yet the question, is it coming home, forces me to ask the more essential question of where is home? Is home where I lay my hat? Oops. Uh, I love my hats, as you can see. <laughs> if so, then home for me is London, because that is where I live. Or is home where I would like to retire? And if it is, that would probably be the Greek island of Corfu. Just love it. <laughs> but most people, I think, would say that home is where your heart is. And if that is the definition of home, then for me, without question, home is Nigeria. If I was to hang any flag out of my window of my car, or wear any kit in support of a football team, <laughs> there you go, there's a Nigerian in the back, right? <laughs> or wear any kit in support of a football team, it would be, well, first of all, it would be West Ham. Thank you, some West Ham fans in here because they are pound for pound the best team in the world. Sorry, any Spurs supporters. But otherwise, it would be the green-white green of the Nigerian flag. If England were to play Nigeria in the World Cup, it would be the Nigerian anthem that I would sing proudly without any thought or anything in my heart that would tell me differently. And in this sentiment, I'm not alone. It's English Italians will be supporting Italy at the final. English Indians will support India in any cricket match between the two nations. But why? What is it that determines our sense of identity? And how does that identity affect our interaction with each other? I mean, it's not as if Nigeria is more familiar to me. In many ways, it's not. In many ways, I am more of an outsider in my home than I am here. When I go back home, most often what people call me is London boy. <laughs> or even further, Oimbu, which literally means white person, <laughs> because of the values that I express, which seem in conflict with the values around me in my home. So England should be the place that I call home. But then there are the experiences in this country. In my first week of school, age nine, in this country, although I was born in this country, we went back, and then I came back here, age nine, I had three fights with other kids in my school because they kept calling me the N-word, or to be more precise, Nignog, because apparently that was funnier. I didn't like it, and so I fought didn't last long in that school. Parents took me out, went somewhere else. On my first day as a barrister, in October 1998, when I was called to the bar, and I was proudly standing there with my parents dressed in Nigerian gear, celebrating our heritage. A judge approached us. Uh, she would later go on to sit on the Court of Appeal. I shall mention their names and told me that now that I was called to the bar, now that I was a barrister, now I should consider myself British. She knew nothing about me. She didn't know my values. She didn't know where I identified with nationally, but she must have felt that somehow I would be inspired by these words. On my first day 
as a tenant in my new chambers in November 2000. I was called into a conference room by one of the senior barristers. I thought he was going to welcome me to chambers, maybe offer me to, offer me to kind of be part of one of the big cases he had as a junior barrister, but no. The one, and as it turned out, the only question he asked was, do you have any drugs? I didn't. My life in this country and the lives of many who are in the minority in this country or in their own country is littered with these and other smaller and larger indignities. They happen all the time in different circumstances with different people and it affects you. It drains you. It forces you to constantly juggle between competing personalities that interact with the world in different ways. On some days, you're the fighter and you call out the nonsense because it's nonsense. On other days, you just don't have the stomach for the fight. And you try and play the bigger person, the appeaser, because it's nonsense. No, sir, I don't have any drugs. I must have missed that module of bring drugs to your first day of chambers in law school. It's tiring. You know, on this very day, the 9th of July in 1868, the 14th Amendment to the United States Constitution was ratified in Congress, guaranteeing full citizenship for black people in that country. And yet today, the fight to secure those rights goes on. It is as real and as present as ever. In this country, we have seen the cruelty of the treatment suffered by many of the Windrush generation who are treated as non-citizens despite having devoted their entire lives to this country, in this country, on the strength of promises that were made to them. And if you've watched any of England's football games in this tournament, you'll have noticed the irony, or I would say the absurdity, of England fans cheering for the players as they sing the national anthem, then booing them as they take a knee against racism, booing as they kneel against racism, and then cheering them again as they play and win. Absurd. In every country, on every continent in this planet, not just in the Western world, those that are in minority often feel that same sense of fractured identity which complicates the relationship they have with the place that by all rights they should be able to call home. And identity, this sense of who we are and who we perceive ourselves to be, has a far-reaching impact on how we live our lives. In my work as a communications skills coach, I am often approached by entrepreneurs and executives who come to me for help with their communication skills. And by and large, in every case, they are hampered by a self-limiting belief that they have convinced themselves of that I am not a natural public speaker. And this is the identity that they've crafted for themselves. It's what they've come to believe about themselves. And because that is who they are in their own eyes, it becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy. Their world becomes controlled 
and compressed by this self-limiting self-perception. So when they give presentations, they go badly because that is what they believe will happen. That is what they think they are. Their thoughts become their reality. Some of my clients suffer panic attacks. At the thought of giving a speech, and pretty soon they are avoiding every opportunity to speak even though they know it will enhance and benefit their careers. That's what identity does. Because of this, they'll watch other less talented people go further than them. And then they start to doubt themselves and their ability to do the job. And this leads to imposter syndrome, which is literally where you believe that you are the fraud and that you're about to be exposed as the fraud, despite knowing how good you are. Now, by the way, if that's you, <laughs> you're not alone. Uh, loads of surveys have been done on the fear of public speaking, which has been placed at number one in uh, humankind's list of greatest fears above uh, clowns, heights, death. So the first thing that I do is to work with them on reframing their identity as communicators. And I take them through what I call the communicator's quadrant. And you guys can actually see where you're placing this. So in quadrant A is the strugglers. These are people who really aren't good at what they do and aren't very good at communicating either. Most people don't put themselves in quadrant A. Then there's quadrant B, who are the people who still aren't very good at what they do, but they certainly talk a good game. Nobody puts themselves in quadrant B, but we probably all know a few Bs. Um, sure, none of them are in this room, but you probably know some in your life. Then, then there's quadrant C, which is the strivers. These are people who know that they are good at what they do, but they struggle with communicating. Pretty much all my clients will identify as quadrant C. Because really what they're looking for is to move into the final quadrant, the quadrant where the leaders are, the ones who are good at what they do and they're great at communicating it. And that's the challenge, how to move from C to D, from a striver to a leader. And that depends very much on your identity of yourself. And then I show them a list of famous people who also struggled with public speaking. When we think of Moses, right, or at least if you're as old as I am anyway, we think of the booming voice of Charlton Heston in the movie The Ten Commandments, you know, saying, Pharaoh, let my people go. But the real Moses, the Moses of the Bible, was petrified of public speaking. In Exodus chapter 4, verse 10, he pleads with God, saying, Pardon your servant, Lord, I have never been eloquent, neither in the past nor since you have spoken to your servant. I am slow of speech and slow of tongue. Uh, it's said that he had a stammer. Or when we think of Beyonce, we think of the fearless singer, multi-talented actor, producer, writer, and all things Beyonce. But as her father revealed, he said about her that I would never have Beyonce up here public speaking. She's not good at it. Solange, her sister, was at Yale. She's incredible at it. But I know all of my artists' weaknesses. They all have weaknesses. And in fact, Beyonce created an alter ego called Sasha Fierce, into which she projected all her passion and her confidence and her intensity, and it would be Sasha Fierce that would go up on stage and perform. So with each of my clients, I ask them to define their alter ego. That's who they would really like to be as communicators, and then we create an alter ego for them to project into. Now, the rule is that they have to be that alter ego at all times in everything that they do. So whenever they interact with people, they have to do it as their alter ego. 
Whenever they give presentations, they have to give it as they believe that alter ego would deliver. And at first, it feels alien. But it is effective. Because sometimes it's when you put on a mask that you can hide your personal vulnerabilities and you can project more of yourself into what you are doing. And then as they lean into this alter ego, they start to take on characteristics and qualities of the alter ego. Because the thing about the alter ego is it isn't somebody different. Clark Kent is Superman, but Superman is also Clark Kent. They're one and the same. Your alter ego is just a different version of you. That's the power of identity. Now, for those of you who want to know how to create an alter ego, I might ask a few of you now. Um, there are actually four simple steps. So the first is identify who your alter ego needs to be for whatever challenge it is you're facing. I'm going to ask some of you actually in a second, so make sure you're thinking about this. The next is to create an image in your mind of that alter ego. How do you walk when you're in this alter ego? How do you talk? How do you communicate? What do you eat? How do you smell? How do you interact with other people? The third is to pick your adjective. So you've got to pick an adjective that defines the key quality that this alter ego needs to have for the challenges in life that you're going to face. And the final part is to combine it with a name that's related to you in some way. So nickname, maiden name, name you went by in school, name of a character you love, doesn't matter. And that is how you create your alter ego name. So for a while, I've had different ones personally, but for a while, I was badass, brother. <laughs> Anyone got an alter ego? Anyone got a name? Tom? <laughs> Oh, wow. Okay. <laughs> and what was his personal challenge? <laughs> Even as a barrister, I've seen how identity plays a big part in the outcome of cases and trials. There's an old adage that says, a good lawyer knows the law, a great lawyer <laughs> knows the judge. Now, that really is probably more based on nepotism. <laughs> There's a lot of nepotism in the legal industry. Uh, but there is also a significant degree of truth to that statement that I've come to appreciate in over 23 years of practice as a barrister. Because judges and juries are human. And like all humans, they are informed and affected by their preconceptions and prejudices that they have about people, the witnesses, the parties, even the lawyers in the case. And so a big part of my job as a lawyer is to understand and manage those preconceptions. I was once shouted at by a judge when representing a client in a discrimination case. Uh, the case that my client had complained about the fact that she was often referred to as angry, she was a black woman, by her colleagues when she was just being assertive. And so I explained to the judge that part of our case, it was a discrimination case, would be about the application of the stereotype of the angry black woman to my client. At which point the judge shouted at me. He insisted that I was talking complete rubbish because he played basketball with a whole bunch of black guys and they'd never once mentioned anything like this before. Now, in court, you can't be a fighter with the judge, at least not openly. You can be passive aggressive, but not openly aggressive. Uh, so I paused and I explained to the judge that no, it really was a thing. And I advised that over the lunch break, he take a few moments and Google the phrase, angry black woman. And so he did. And he came back after the lunch break, slightly chastened, a little bit calmer, uh, and explained that he had done just that. And he was surprised 
because there were millions of entries about the term angry black woman. And he'd actually clicked on one or two of them. And one of them he had seen was about Michelle Obama, who had struggled through life because that same stereotype had been applied to her. And so in that case, the judge experienced a shift in his perception of identity, helped by his affinity for the identity of somebody else, Michelle Obama. And that gave him a better connection and better understanding of the identity and the struggles with that of my client. I only wish I could have been a fly on the wall at his next basketball game. <laughs> Guys, you didn't tell me about this. <laughs> Identity matters, even in the justice system, sometimes more than the evidence and the documents and the law itself. I am a member, former president, in fact, of the 100 Black Men of London. It's one of the proudest things that I've ever done in my life. And in the very first session that we hold with our mentees of our mentoring program, we talk to them about self-identity. And we define it or divide it into three core elements, which is self-image, because so much of what young black boys and girls see of themselves, especially in the media, is of drug dealers and rappers, or at best, sportsmen and entertainers and prostitutes. So we work with them on shifting their sense of self and how they see themselves. Then we talk about self-knowledge, which is about understanding your history and the richness of your African heritage. Because it's when you know where you came from that you can see and believe in the possibilities of your future. And finally, we talk about self-esteem. Because we know that they will face great challenges in life, and it is only when they believe in themselves that we will have the fight and the power to work through the challenges that they will inevitably face. You know, one of my favorite moments, actually, is taking some of our mentees to a big conference in the United States every year. We haven't been able to do it for the last two years. But we take them, and one of the aspects is they have to give a presentation to the entire conference, over a 1,000 people with more watching online. And it's, it's a fascinating process, because I see them just before they step onto stage, and you can see that they are full of anxiety and full of self-doubt. Will they able, be able to do this? Are people going to laugh? And then they get up there. And they're sitting on stage and they can see me and they're like, why is Collar grinning? <laughs> but that's because I know what's going to come. Because once they start speaking and once they get out those first few words and they lean into it, they realize that the world isn't going to swallow them up. They realize that the audience is on their side. They identify with them. It helps that they have British accents in America. <laughs> Uh, seriously, like having a British accent and a black person in America is like puts you in a different kind of stratosphere. But once they speak, they start to relax and they speak their truth. You know, we once sat next to an elderly gentleman on the whole coming from Britain thing, and he listened to us for a while and he leaned over and said, You're the boys from England, right? Yes, sir. Nice to meet you. How are you doing? What do you guys speak out there? French? <laughs> English? <laughs> and when the mentees come off stage, you can see that they are literally several inches taller just in that moment, just from that experience. They are bigger, more confident, full of self-belief. Their identities and who they perceive themselves to be has changed forever. And that means we have to consider the central question, which is, are our identities fixed or are they fluid? Are we the same as we are from cradle to grave? 
or can our identities be changed or enhanced or even grown? At school, I was quite an average student. I was decent but not exceptional at my studies, although I had the advantage of being a naturally hard worker. And at one stage, I passed the Oxford exams, uh, entrance exams, which took me to the next stage of getting interviews, which I did at Jesus College. But when you walk into a place where no one looks like you, no one talks like you, uh, most people have never really interacted with anybody like you, it's really not hard to predict how that's going to go. Uh, in fact, I discovered subsequently that Jesus College in Oxford is also known as the Welsh College, which probably explains why there were probably about 10 times as many white guys with red hair as there were black people on the day, because uh, it was only one. Uh, so I didn't get in, and to be honest, if I'm honest, that really affected me. Because I went from being you know, a promising student who might be the first Nigerian maybe to get into Jesus College to kind of an average student who lost his enthusiasm for the work. One of the challenges of higher education is to create environments in which students feel empowered to learn. They refer to university studies as disciplines because I think that is where we go to really have our minds forged and formed and we learn to think for ourselves. In the recent much troubled report by the Center for Social Justice, uh, which is called Facing the Facts, Ethnicity and Disadvantage in Britain, one of the notable findings they made was that ethnic minority children were starting to actually have comparable results at GCSE level to their white British counterparts. And yet, when it came to university and higher education, the graduation rates were noticeably lower. This is such an important thing to fix and to get right, because the period of higher education that is sandwiched between school and work has an outsized impact on our sense of self and our identities. I can tell you that my university experience was the making of me, because I got to study philosophy and politics. For the first time, I felt my mind awaken. Aristotle, Nietzsche, Marx, Hegel, the Federalist Papers, see this is my actual copy from university, still highlighted with references from Alexander Hamilton. And one of the key precepts you learn in philosophy is by the 17th century uh, French philosopher René Descartes, uh, who's often thought of as the father of modern philosophy with his focus on epistemology, which is kind of study of knowledge and rational thought, basically. And he said, uh, je pense donc je suis, which means I think, therefore I am. Which is that the fact that I am thinking at all about whether I exist proves that I exist. And this revolutionary principle gives an insight into the very essence of identity. Because if my existence is determined by my thought, then maybe I can change who I am by changing the way that I think. Steve Jobs, the legendary founder of Apple, believed that computers and technology could change the world. And he changed the world of technology by following the simple mantra of think different. He actually lived that identity from taking LSD, because he believed it cleared his mind, <laughs> Uh, to driving without a license plate because he found a loophole that meant he could drive a new car every six months and not need a license plate. That's different, I guess. Or Lin-Manuel Miranda, who brilliantly changed the relationship that many Americans have to the origin story of their country by using the very modern medium of hip-hop and actors of color to give a sense to people of the underground, insurgent, outsider nature of the founding fathers. By forcing us to think differently about them, 
He has helped change people's perception and interaction with the country in which they live. At the start of the European Championships, the England manager Gareth Southgate wrote an open letter to the country called Dear England, in which he explained his philosophy of football. It's really quite an unexpectedly brilliant piece of writing. And in that open letter, he explained that he wants his players to play for their country and produce moments that people will remember. But he also talks about the pride that he has in the things that this special group of players, as he describes them, have stood and knelt for. Because, as he writes, it is their duty to continue to interact with the public on matters such as equality, inclusivity, and racial justice, while using the power of their voices to help put debates on the table and raise awareness and educate. Now, you will probably have heard the mantra that what's your thoughts, they become your words. What's your words, they become your actions. What's your actions, they become your habits. What's your habits, they become your character. And what's your character, because it becomes your destiny. It's been attributed to everyone from the ancient Chinese philosopher Lao Tzu to the British Prime Minister Margaret Thatcher. But it means that if we change the way we think and we change the way we look at our identity, we will change our belief in ourselves and our interaction and experience with each other. In short, just by controlling and directing our thoughts, we can choose who we want to be and we can create our own destiny. Because as Mahatma Gandhi said, you must be the change you want to see in the world. So this Sunday, for the first time in my life, I will support England <laughs> in the final because my complicated relationship and affinity with this country still has a lot of evolving left to do. But I am inspired by the example of the players themselves and by the words of the England manager who said in his open letter, that no matter what happens, I just hope that their parents, teachers, and club managers will turn to them and say, look, that's the way to represent your country. That's what England is about. That's what is possible. Now, I know tomorrow or next week, I will see or experience something that again challenges and undermines my sense of identity within this country. It might be a cabbie that declines to pick me up. It could be a court clerk that assumes that I'm the defendant, not the barrister. It could be somebody mispronouncing my name. Uh, my name is Kolarili Shinaike, but I once called up a solicitor who, uh, when, it, the, when she answered the phone, said, who is this? I said, it's Kola. I said, oh, I was told it was Colin from Ikea. But at this moment, in this place, for this weekend, I think this is the place that I will lay my hat, and this is the place that I will call home. Thank you. again. <laughs> um, I've no, I have um, absolutely no notes from that, um, but I think I speak for everyone to feel like I've taken something that I can't articulate at the moment. Um, so um, all I say is that um, um, I've, we wanted to do something a little bit different. Um, um, Anel has um, agreed to speak with uh, Colorelli now. Um, what we're going to do is have an open discussion. I think this, we'll see how it goes. 
And we would also love input something. I don't want to be greedy for time now, but we have it if we need it. <laughs> um, we have some prizes to give. Um, so see how it goes. If, if you, you know, you, it's all your call. So um, and if, if people want to add something at some stage, we'll, we'll take it from there. Please permit me on one occasion to address you this way. I want to say that was amazing, my badass brother. <laughs> <laughs> Amazing. Thank you, I appreciate that. Thank you. <laughs> I have to say I'm a little bit disappointed though because I was thinking that at least one person would have done the little tongue rolling. I really can't do it. But I thought one per has anyone got that ability in the house? Come on, don't disappoint. Let's try another applause. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Just one, just one. <laughs> So we really appreciate you being here. Now that was such an informative, uh, inspiring, uh, heartfelt presentation. I think we're all left with major respect and it connected. And that's the amazing thing about being authentic. Uh, all of us as humans can connect with that authenticity. I was gonna ask you, <laughs> but you've answered, who's your superhero? I want you to say it with your own voice. So I want you to say, who's your superhero? Uh, well, so, the person in my life that I have actually been the most inspired by, uh, sadly, is no longer with us. Mm -hmm. He um, was the uh, late Chief Bolaige in Nigeria. Mm. Uh, he was a governor uh, there in Nigeria. He was um, just a brilliant man in every, um, in every respect. Sadly, he was assassinated um, because that's what happened back in Nigeria in those days. Um, but he was the person that w really is the reason I became a barrister. Mm -hmm. uh, I didn't really know what I wanted to do beyond thinking about philosophy at school, at university. And he suggested that I had the makings of a barrister, probably because he saw that I love to argue. Um, <laughs> and I kind of followed in his footsteps, went to the same in the court as him. Uh, and I still remember, in, t in terms of being an orator, for instance, he's still the best orator that I personally have ever known. I still remember him giving a speech to the Nigerian Law Society, where at the end he started singing Bob Dylan's Blowing in the Wind. Mm -hmm. And I sat there like, what? Wow, you can do that? Like, you know, amazing. Uh, so that would be my personal superhero in terms of an individual. Uh, in a personal note, also my father um, just inspires me because he's kind of the definition of a father. You know, just humble, but, you know, fiercely loving of his children and um, never complains, um, which is a good thing because I complain a lot. Yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah, so this is amazing. Now, I think it is really amazing that you have Gareth Southgate's uh, in image up. I have to say, he's uh, of the various England managers we've seen, I think I've taken note of him more than any other. Uh, there's something about him. And there's something about inspiring individuals, getting into their soul, connecting with him. You, talk, you spoke, or it's been spoken about today, this idea of education. And I'm gonna ask you about your higher education experience and, and those individuals who enabled or inhibited, I don't know, you're gonna let us know. But I think that uh, higher education is a powerful place. How many of you here have ever taught in secondary school? We had uh, Lady Mirza tell us something about that. Okay, uh, isn't it interesting that it was always the argumentative students who would come to you and say, sir, miss, you know, I'm thinking I want to study law. And I just thought that that was uh, quite funny. But there was a poem I came across when I was working in secondary school called Mrs. Tilcher's Class. Has anybody ever heard of it, Mrs. Tilcher's Class? Look it up when you can. I think I shared it with you once. But it got to my gut because here you heard of a teacher who created an experience when people came into her classroom. And I think all of us have experienced educators who were like that. You felt that you mattered personally to them. And I wanted to ask you for you, in your higher education experience, when we think about shaping identity, uh, did you come across any cheerleaders? Is there anybody that you remember today who helped you on your way? Or was there someone who, on the com converse, was maybe trying to hinder you? How did you either gather wings in your sail or, or, in, or achieve in spite of your higher education experiences? So for me personally, so at school, I never felt, I mean, went to an excellent school, but I never felt there was anybody that particularly had my interests at heart. It's just one of those places. So I, I always felt I was quite average at school. 
And then in university, I don't think there was any particular individual that I would point to, but it really was philosophy. Mm -hmm. That just, so philosophy was one of those subjects that, to be honest, you kind of either got or you didn't. I was just, and I was just lucky that I did. So, you know, I, I would read, you know, Aristotle and things and just be blown away and I'd be arguing in my mind with Aristotle and you know things like that just because it really brought me alive so I think it's more that I felt connected to something that mattered to me and that's what really awoke in my mind because um, lecturers I mean I hope they are better now <laughs> but lecturers kind of had the approach of I'm tenured, so I can speak, you listen, you don't listen, doesn't really matter. So they would just kind of talk and, you know, they've done the same lecture for 20 years, they wouldn't really vary it much. You show up, you don't show up, nobody really cared. Um, I showed up just because I was a bit of a geek at it, you know, because so I loved it and enjoyed it. But, so as a result, I don't think a lot of the lecturers I would look back and say, oh, that person inspired me. But it's really, for me, it's the environment of universities and places like that, the other people that challenge your thinking, that challenge your thought process, that make you either want to do better in one area or want you to ignore an area and you interact with. That, for me, is the greatness of higher education, and that's certainly what I experienced at Birmingham University. Amazing. I, I like the little shout out there as well. It seems to me that you... <laughs> yeah, exactly. It seems to me that you made Aristotle and Marx your cheerleaders. Yeah, uh, I love those guys. Yeah. <laughs> and, and I've always thought that's one of the amazing things. So uh, what would be the challenge then? Because I know you speak of mentoring and you're very proud of the work you've done in the 100 Black Men organization, both in the UK and the US. What would be your challenge uh, to the uh, press for time, uh, COVID challenged, uh, <laughs> more marking lecturers that we have in our institution, which I just have to take a moment and acknowledge my colleagues. I think the students here would say that here at Bloomsbury Institute, it's awash with, with lecturers who go the extra mile. But what would you say about the transformational power that is in the hand of the academic with regards to influencing identity? So that's a really tough one. I mean, I know for me personally and for what I've seen with students, it's, and I think, um, uh, I think it was Mirza, Charles, Charles A. Mirza, the comedian spoke towards it, is it's a place of learning, which means it really has to come from the students themselves, which means as a lecturer, I think as a student, and even when I do my coaching, it's fine to say I don't know, as long as it's followed up with, so let's find out, mm -hmm. right? Because then it's the students saying, well, what about this? And you don't, even though you can see, you know, 100 miles in front of that ain't going to work. So, okay, that could be right. Let's try it. And by engaging and trying and analyzing and thinking and coming to your own conclusion that, oh, no, that doesn't work. That's a dead end. You're learning so much more than just being told the answer. And it's, okay, fine. So I think allowing space for exploration is a far more effective way of getting people to want to learn than just giving the answer. And that's what I think higher education has the space to do in a way that school really doesn't. School now just seems to be, I know that the bell curve that um, doctor was kind of talking about, school now seems to be just get them in, get them out, you know, hear the stats as long as we are. It kind of caters to pushing the those who are brilliant or those who are brilliant as far as you can go pushing those who are really struggling up to the minimum mark and everyone else in the middle yeah you're right um and i think that's really doing our children a disservice mm -hmm. thank you you have a, a really <laughs> It's, it's clear that you have a really rich identity, and I love the fact that you spoke about this identity as something that's evolving and not fixed. And I just want to take a moment to celebrate with you uh, this journey from a nine-year-old boy who comes back home 
uh, and is struggling. But, but, you know, fighting spirit is a good thing. Your, your parents did the right thing, because that could have been problematic if, if that trajectory continued. But, you know, I want to take you back to this idea of nine-year-old boy, and here we see you today. We see a communications, uh, you know, coach. We see barrister. We see family man. Uh, we see uh, one who's willing to be vulnerable. Uh, one who's got uh, enough skill and resolve to deal with the challenge of a, a judge, but actually to help the judge on their own journey towards identity. Because life is all these things, isn't it? And we do so that we can be. So I wanted to ask you, how did you navigate and carve out your identity? And it's, it's valuable for all of us to hear because we're still on that journey. How did you carve out and navigate your identity in a space that didn't necessarily tell you that you could be who you are today? Um, I think everything in this way is trial and error. You know, I'd love to... So there's a speech that Steve Jobs gave uh, known as the Stanford Address, uh, which his, his idea there was it's only when you look back that you can connect the dots and see that everything was meant to be. But when you're looking forward, you really don't have any idea. So you just do what seems right in the moment. Uh, and kind of as you get better at it, you make better decisions. But really, it's trial and error. And then when you look back, so now I can look back at my life and realize that almost everything I have done and been through in my life has brought me to the point I am today. Um, is actually a line in, in a movie, Amistad, which um, I actually don't particularly like. I don't think Steven Spielberg does black stories very well, but that's a different story. Um, but it's in that movie, there's a line where the main character, um, uh, Jimon Hensu, I think it is, says, I'm going to reach back and call my ancestors to help us because in this moment, I am the entire reason they ever existed. It's looking back that you can see that stuff. But looking forward, I think you just make the best decision you can um, and hope it doesn't mess up. Thank you. I just want to forewarn you that I'm about to open the floor. Our time is running out. And I want to give our students in particular an opportunity to ask a question. Take the opportunity. It's good for your identity. Okay? <laughs> it really is. Uh, but I wanted to ask you about this idea of imposter syndrome that some of us more than others may experience. Uh, what is the role within higher education, would you say, to help individuals to be able to navigate that threat? Because imposter syndrome, you know, it poses a threat to confidence. It poses a threat to you being who you can be. Uh, what would you advise is potentially the role that higher education can play in helping individuals to navigate or, as it were, to, to skip over that challenge, land firmly on your feet and keep running with who you are and who you're supposed to be? I don't know. That's all right. <laughs> um, no, I'm, I'm honest because unless things have changed, I mean, it's, what, 91, let's say 94, so it's been a while since I've been at uni. But I, I, didn't, I don't look at that period and think about my lecturers or my, I think there was a, you know, um, kind of tutor kind of character being the person or the people that help me in anything more than just giving me the knowledge that I needed for the course. Um, but I don't think it needs to be. I think it really is the environment. I think it's probably helping students to find their niche, find their, their kind of circle, so expose them to lots of different activities and societies. So I joined loads of societies. Mm -hmm. And it's probably actually that that helped me find, oh, these are my people, and then feel more comfortable. And then once you realize that you're not alone, it gives you more confidence to be yourself. That's actually one of the advantages of social media, I think. Mm -hmm. As for all the challenges that we know social media has, the ability to know that I love this thing that seems really weird and unique, but actually there is a group in Guatemala <laughs> that is into the same thing is really empowering. Mm -hmm. So I think probably higher education, in a way COVID has kind of forced us to do it, can embrace the opportunities that exist from the interactive nature that life now is and just help students find their niche so that they feel connected and then they'll feel more confident. Mm -hmm. 
but that's just a guess. <laughs> that's wonderful. I can't tell you how delighted I was to hear in your address that when the, uh, uh, the senior barrister, perhaps a QC, asked you uh, for drugs, you were unable to supply him. I, uh, that filled me with great delight. But uh, I, I just, my final uh, thing I want to ask you to do is actually we do have law students here. And I, I can say from my own uh, journey on this, uh, you know, this life of law, it's tough. And, and one of the things that's always on my mind is how can we help our law students? All students, you can get something from this. But in particular, I'm speaking about the law students because of the uh, problems that are inherent with it, systemic even within this industry. What would you say to the law student who's just starting out, who's now thinking, once I get my first in my degree, it's plain sailing, who might not get a first in the degree? What, what do you have to say to spur them along on their journey? And then it's over to you guys, so be ready. There is one advice that I give uh, that I only ever give when it comes to law because it is a really, really tough industry. And it's, if you are unsure that this is what you want to do, don't do it because it will grind you down. Uh, so it's now so competitive that even if you are white, male, middle class, you don't have any guarantees. It used to be you could stay in, but now you, you really can't. So anyone... So if you're unsure, if you're not certain that this is what I have to do with my life, find something else. There's a whole load more out there in the world, especially in today's world. But if you are certain, don't let anybody tell you no. Don't be fooled by the I have to have a first from Cambridge or whatever. I can tell you that the best barristers that I know and the best barristers I've ever come, ac come across or come against have never been the Oxford and the Cambridge graduates and the people who were supposedly the most, you know, the smartest. In fact, they actually tend to be pretty bad barristers. And by that, I mean not that they don't have an academic understanding of the law, but law is actually so much more about people management. You're managing the judge, managing the clients, managing your opponents, managing yourself. And if you don't actually have the ability to manage all of that, you will be a really average lawyer. You know, I've negotiated against some barristers where I'm kind of internally laughing, right? So I have the advantage of being the Nigerian, so, you know, we grow up haggling, right? It's in the blood. Right, and, you know, I remember dealing with one barrister where they made an offer and I just said no because I knew what my clients wanted and they'd already made an offer that was actually what my clients would have accepted. But I said no because I just perceived that this wasn't the final offer. Now there's a rule, it's like you don't negotiate against yourself. But I said no, I didn't counter offer and he came and said, oh, well, okay, hold on, hold on, hold on. Then he went away for five minutes and then came back with a new offer, higher offer. Okay. And I still hadn't made an offer, I was like no. I mean, okay, we just hold on. And he went, and literally about four or five times, this, this poor guy came back with new offer that was higher each time. And I just kept on saying no. And then eventually I made my first offer, which was far in excess of where he was. And so, oh, okay. And then he went back and he just went back and forth. To the end, we got some ridiculously good offer that was just based on the fact that he did not know how to manage people. Uh, and he was, because you kind of do this when you're a lawyer, you look up your opponent and kind of see where they're from. And he was literally one of these double firsts from Cambridge guys. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So manage, understanding how to live in the real world, mm -hmm. not live in your head in the academic world, is really important when you get out into the real world of law. Massive. Big message. Know who you are. Be at peace with who you are. Project that confidently. It will serve you. Thank you. I've got goose pimples. I don't know about anybody else. I see a question. You. <laughs> well, I saw the hand. It's like the auction, isn't it? I got that little message. So the floor is yours. <laughs> So, um, I, okay. um, I, I, I didn't predict that he would be that good, to be honest. He seemed like a nice guy, but kind of mild. 
uh, but it's it's just in paying attention to the way he's gone about his business. It seems not to be based on some sort of entitlement of football is coming home because we invented this and surely it must, right? Um, it actually just seems to be based on football is important, um, but life is more important. Uh, so we're playing for a, almost like a higher purpose. Um, and I think that's given a humility to the team that actually means that they are kind of performing better than they would when they thought, uh, as previous generations of players have, that they were entitled to win somehow, that it must come home. Um, so we'll see. But yeah, I mean, read the letter. It's, it's really one of the best um, pieces of writing that I've seen in a while uh, on this topic. Thank you. I was Maybe seeing I some uh, wrap-up signs, but I didn't. Okay, who, I was looking for them, and they, okay, I've got it now. Thank you. I was looking in the wrong place. <laughs> yes, go for it. Lady at the back, last question. wrap up and I'm seeing two hands and I'm struggling. I've had the nod, we could go ahead. So we've got one from the president and one from uh, one of our uh, former uh, students and also now present academic. So both of you, please. If we take both questions and then uh, Col Dr. Colorelli, let's step him up while he's here. <laughs> we'll respond, go for it. Just a question about your neck. Is there meaning attached to it? I didn't hear that. Your name. Oh, yeah. 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 So it's basically yeah, it's basically cool or la really. So um, the one who brings honor or wealth to the home, basically, <laughs> still trying. To... <laughs> Bring the honor and the wealth. Your your, so, your parents named well. Well, so in in Yoruba culture, actually, your your it's your technically your grandparents that name you. Um, so your grandparents will give a name to the parents to say this is the name. Now, actually, just I don't know if we've got the time, but my father actually came to me before my children were going to be born, and kind of like yes. So the name I have chosen, I was like, you know, dad, 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 dad. Hold on, hold on, right? Things have to things have to evolve, right? You're speaking to this London boy. Things have to evolve. Um, so actually what we agreed in terms of the process, because actually I love that tradition. I think, I think your name is what you carry for life, right? It should mean something. Um, so what we agreed was that they would actually kind of give us a list of names that they liked. And then from that, that list, we would choose a name that really meant a lot to us. Uh, and so that's what we did with both our children. Um, so yeah, that's what my personal name means and then my children's names are uh, Omolulu, which is child of God, effectively, and Similola, which is rests in grace. Um, but that was out of a long list of names that my parents gave us, some of which I'm like, hell yeah, no. <laughs> that's, that's beautiful. And I'm just thinking your father was probably quite peeved, you know, by this idea. You educate these, these children and now they come and don't follow your traditions. But it's good. Good you gave him some honor. Please, Samuel. I don't know but I came to this institution in 2016, and that's my first time coming to law. I came from, I came from HR into law, and my three years of my master's program, I find the best of teaching here. They are trying to help me. I left to first class. And I'm going to be proud of them. I'm going to speak to my life and put the distinction to you. Wow. I have a lot of culture of hard work from here. And I must say, two people here last two years, Joe, and Jenny, 
they have pushed me to the limits. Wow. But by the end of the year, I completed this thing. So, Joe, thank you very much. Very different from my experience, so that's great. <laughs> that's wonderful. Can I just ask, you're obviously you're English speaking as well. Uh, in Nigeria, what's the language you speak? So, in Nigeria is about 400 different dialects. But I'm Yoruba. You, yes, yeah, Yoruba. Which is that's, what, that's right. Any Yoruba speakers here? I, that's what I was hoping for. So, I'm going to give you the honor. Can you thank him for his presentation in Yoruba? I will end in English and we'll be done. We'll be off. Please, please stand. And so, my brother. Thank you so much, Kolareli Shoneke. Forgive me if my pronunciation is not perfect. It's been an excellent presentation. Thank you for what you've given. Thank you that on the three occasions I've met you in my life, you've always spoken words of life. May that always be your experience, your portion, and your gift to those you speak to. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. I assume you're just standing because it's time to go, right? But... <laughs>